Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure we have all different uh, time zones here. So grateful um, for all of you to to join us this morning to uh, discuss the Kirby Impact Prize for this for this year, the 2025 Kirby Impact Prize. It's the fifth year of our prize. And um, and it looks like we have we have a good group of people. So we will go ahead and get started. My name is Kim Ling Sam, and I'm the Senior Program Director for CASE, the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. I'm joined by my colleagues, Aaron Warsham, CASE's Executive Director, and David Wilkerson, CASE's Program Coordinator, who will both be sharing links and responding to as many questions as they can through the chat. At the end of the session, we'll make time to respond to questions not as easily answered in the chat, so feel free to go ahead and put your questions in at any time and we'll definitely get to them. Please note also that this session is being recorded and the recording along with the slide deck will be available on the website um, sometime over the next couple of days. So who is Case? Who is FM Kirby? And why are we here together speaking about a $150,000 prize? CASE is an award-winning research and education center based at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Our mission is to prepare leaders and organizations with the business skills needed to achieve lasting change. And we do this in three main ways. Education, by training the next generation of leaders who will tackle some of the world's greatest challenges. Thought leadership, applying a practical research lens to the field of social entrepreneurship and impact investing. And through practitioner engagement, by building strong strategic networks and developing tools to accelerate the pace of change. So we're really thrilled to have been selected as the home for the FM Kirby Prize for Scaling Impact to further support impact leaders around the world. This prize is made possible through the, a generous gift from and wonderful collaboration with the FM Kirby Foundation. The FM Kirby Foundation is a family foundation that's been in operation since 1931 and which primarily invests in several impact areas, but within a few key geographic communities. The Kirby Impact Prize provides an opportunity for the foundation to have an international reach. For our session today, we'll focus on answering four questions. What is the prize and how do I apply? What's case looking for in strong applicant organizations? What happens if I'm selected? And what can I do if I have more questions? I wanna quickly highlight the question where we'll spend the most time during the session today. What's CASE looking for in a strong applicant organization? We wanted to take the opportunity of this prize and your attention to share with you some of the key things that we've learned over two decades of research, training, and collaboration with social enterprises and funders and which have informed the questions we ask and the criteria against which we're evaluating the responses. If you're interested in this prize, it's because you're working to scale your impact in addressing any one of the world's great social or environmental challenges. And that's a long, complicated journey. While only one of you will win the prize this year, we want all of you to succeed. And we wanna help level up your pitch to your next funder and the work that it reflects. So we'll be spending the bulk of the time today sharing what we've learned and seen that funders expect from the scaling enterprises seeking their support. But before we dive into that, let's cover the basics of the prize. The Kirby Impact Prize is a global prize designed to amplify and accelerate the work of impact-driven enterprises who are working to scale their impact on social or environmental problems around the world in small communities, um, larger geographic regions, you're working to scale. Each year, one winning organization will receive a one-time prize of $150,000 US dollars in unrestricted funds. And we think that this prize is unique in, uh, in a few ways. One is the scaling focus. Um, many social impact prizes focus on recognizing new or early stage ideas but this prize will accelerate great ideas and solutions that have been tested and have gained traction. Next is the institutional and brand support from CASE 
from Fuqua and from Duke. The prize is positioned within an academic institution that upholds a rigorous and neutral approach to evaluating applications. And our brands, we will use our brands to help elevate the profiles of the finalists and of the winning enterprise. The next thing that's unique is that it's open to both nonprofit and for-profit models. We're pretty agnostic about your legal form and we're not limiting the award just to nonprofit organizations. Our research indicates that governance structure doesn't really predict impact. So we're open to, to any and all. And lastly, unrestricted funding. Also from our research, we understand the importance of flexible capital for scaling enterprises. So our unrestricted funding allows the awardee the freedom to make strategic pivots and build the infrastructure that they need to accelerate impact. For those of you who've applied in previous years, I just wanna call out a couple of changes to the prize over the past year or two. For this year, we've refocused and streamlined the questions in the first application phase to include just those that we've learned help us best identify aligned enterprises. Instead of 10 application questions as we had last year, we're asking only six this year. We continue to have a tiered application process, which we'll review shortly. We've also adjusted the timeline a bit this year with applications due in December, as opposed to January, as they were due last year. Last year's prize saw a few more changes. Uh, last year, we increased the prize amount from $100,000 to $150,000, acknowledging we, I'm sorry, um, we also uh, added a $1,000 award for each finalist organization, which acknowledges the effort that organizations make it get to the finalist round put into the process. Um, and we also formalized a program through CASE to bring in our MBA students to be part of the Kirby Impact Prize process. Um, so again, that we're contributing to their education and experience around scaling, um, around social enterprise business models, and how to be a good funder. So who is eligible to apply? The prize is open to all impact enterprises operating anywhere in the world that meet the following criteria. Again, you must be an impact-driven enterprise, but you can operate through any legal form, nonprofit, for-profit, hybrid. Also, because of tax implications, any international enterprise applicant must also have an established presence in the U.S., whereby they're a U.S. taxpayer and hold a federal taxpayer ID number. This could include an organization recognized as an organization exempt from federal income tax um, under IRC Section 501c3 status or a U.S.-based fiscal sponsorship agreement. We've received lots of questions um, uh, over the past couple of years um, about, about this requirement, and we have more information in our frequently asked questions about this, and we'll put the link to that um, in, the, in the chat. Um, next, next requirement is that enterprises need to have a strong evidence base of impact over at least three years and a thoughtful plan for how to use the prize to scale their impact over the next three to five years. We want to see a minimum operating budget of at least $250,000 um, and just want to, to note that uh, we've seen our strongest applica applicants generally have operating budgets between one and four million dollars. That doesn't mean that uh, that those outside of those boundaries are um, are not eligible, but um, but that's generally where we see them. Um, enterprises that apply are required to have a robust formal non discrimination policy in place, and we also want to see that they demonstrate exemplary leadership that aligns with the core values of Fred Morgan Kirby: integrity, resourcefulness, resilience meaningful collaboration, and diversity. The tiered application process for this year is very similar to the one for the past few years. And our intention in designing the process this way is to make sure that our applicants are at the right point, at the right time for scale before asking them to invest additional time into completing an application. We'll delve, delve more into phase one shortly, 
But here's the high level overview of the prize cycle. Phase one, which is what we'll be talking about today, is open to all eligible enterprises and will accept applications between October 24th and December 4th of 2024. Approximately 30 of those phase one applicants will be selected to continue to phase two of the process in January 2025, where we will ask additional questions of those enterprises. And from that group, we will select approximately five finalists to continue through final due diligence and an interview, which will take place in March and April of 2025. And in May of 2025, we will announce the winner of this year's prize. For phase one of this prize cycle, applicants will be expected to answer a set of demographic questions and submit a slide deck or written response introducing the selection committee to your organization, the problem you're working to solve, the impact, traction, and scaling vision behind your solution. Here, it's important to remember that as the subject matter expert, you're inviting us into your world, so feel free to offer additional context as you deem appropriate in your responses. We have all of the questions available on our website. So you can, um, you can, if you would like to get ahead, you are welcome to go ahead and look at the questions and start thinking about um, how you'll prepare your response. The demographic questions will be typed into the application portal and the organizational questions um, again, we, we ask for them to be submitted through a slide deck. And we suggest that so that you can leverage pitch content that you've already created. But if you prefer to submit written responses to the key questions, we'll accept those as well. The link to the application portal will be posted on our website on October 24th. Um, and we'll also send it out to all of you who are registered. And the portal will be open for submissions through December 4th. Due to the limited size of the selection committee, we will only be able to review the first 250 applications that we receive. Um, this is something that we have had in place every single year um, so far, and we've never hit the 250. So, um, so I wouldn't expect that we would this year either. Um, we've been in the high 100s, very low 200s, um, but we've never reached the 250 and had to turn anyone away. And I don't anticipate us having to do so this year. Um, if we're starting to get close, we'll send out communications to let you know. All applications will be evaluated based on three main dimensions, impact, readiness to scale, and leadership. Our questions in phase one focus on elements of impact and readiness to scale, and the questions in our phase two and interview rounds dig deeper into those and add leadership at the leadership dimension as well. I'm gonna quickly go by this, you'll have access to it, to it later. Okay. So now let's delve into what we're actually looking for from applicants for the Kirby Impact Prize. A couple of years ago, CASE's executive director, Aaron Worsham and I, published an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review that conveyed some of the key things we learned from years of research and from becoming funders ourselves as stewards of the Kirby Impact Prize. In less of a tongue-in-cheek way today, we want to incorporate two additional years of experience on top of that and provide more concrete advice to you as it relates to the dimensions of the phase one application. Instead of why we didn't fund your scaling plan, we wanna say, this is how, uh, how we want you to think about your responses so that we can fund your scaling plan. And I'll reiterate, we're spending time here not just for the benefit of the applications we'll be reviewing this year, but also more broadly for your continued work in fundraising to give you a better sense of a scaling funder's expectations for what a scale-ready impact enterprise has learned and accomplished and how such an enterprise can effectively articulate those things to a funder. These are the six questions that we wanna see answered throughout your slide deck that you submit in phase one. In a nutshell, we really just wanna know what it is you're doing, if it works, 
and if you're actually positioning to scale. We hope most of you will let out a silent cheer or sigh of relief because these are topics you've totally got covered in your existing decks. But if not, now's your chance to create those slides because these are things that any funder of scale would expect to see. So you'll use them time and time again. As I mentioned, we're gonna go a layer deeper on each of these questions, sharing what we've learned about what a strong response looks like. So even if you think you have it covered, we hope you can still find some helpful tips within. As we walk through the questions, we'll be sharing examples from the applications of the two most recent Kirby Impact Prize winners, Smart out of India and Samia Nueva out of Guatemala. First, we want to see a slide or two that summarizes your enterprise, really just to help us put the rest of the slides or responses into context. What's your organization? What do you do? What value do you provide? Samia Nueva provides a concise and helpful summary, capturing the three primary pieces of their work, creating more nutritious seeds, getting them to market, and making it sustainable. This summary at the beginning of the deck provides us with really helpful context for the rest of the slides to follow. And here's another example summary slide, this one from SMART, our 2023 Kirby Prize winner, where you can see that just a sentence can help us understand the role and function of the enterprise, so we don't have to make guesses as to what their focus is as we get into the details of the problem and solution. Here we can see that SMART's an e-commerce platform, they're providing services to rural retailers, and they're doing that so that the retailers can sell livelihood products to rural customers. Next, we wanna understand your enterprise or team's reason for being, the problem you're working to solve. We wanna understand why it has continued to be a problem and the barriers or friction points that have prevented it from being adequately addressed. Here again is Samia Nueva. They start big picture, sharing the problem of malnutrition among those with maize-based diets, even providing some numbers for us to appreciate the magnitude of the problem. But they don't stop there. They don't stop with just stating the big problem or what we often see in applications, spending all of their airtime speaking only to the big problem and not to the more specific piece of that that they are planning to tackle. So we can see here that Simia Nueva does get more specific about the piece of the problem they are uniquely positioned to address. That biofortified maize seeds can drastically improve nutrition, but farmers aren't able to afford them. The specificity here is key because it gives us confidence as funders that Samia Nueva has identified and can maintain focus on addressing a meaningful and manageable piece of the larger malnutrition problem. And then we also see then explain some of the reasons that their piece of the problem has persisted that it's not that biofortified seeds don't exist, but rather that friction points in the value chain have prevented them from getting to and being planted by farmers. So now that we've articulated the piece of the problem and the reasons why it persists, we wanna look at its mirror image, the solution that solves for it. We wanna understand a few things here. We want to understand, we want a description of the solution. We want to see how it addresses the key barriers to change. And we want to understand the operational model for implementing that solution sustainably in the real world. So first, let's talk about the solution. In its application, Samia Nueva does a good job of describing what they'll do to achieve their desired change, that they will undertake activities to create the right seeds, get farmers to adopt them and plant them, which will improve the nutrition of the population 
eating the nutritious maize and also increase farmers' incomes. They also importantly explain how the solution addresses the key market and adoption barriers to achieving that change that they had described in their piece of the problem. They speak to how the biofortified seeds will help address the farmers' yield and climate challenges, thus increasing their incomes and bolstering adoption. They uh, speak to how they will use incentives and advocacy to align supply and demand, making the market, market function. And they speak about engaging the government through uh, subsidies to make it sustainable. This piece is critical. We want you to tell us what you are doing to address the key reasons that the problem you are trying to solve has persisted even in the face of other attempts at solving it. So next, we wanna understand how this solution will actually be operationalized. The business model that shows how products and services flow between key partners, how funding flows, and generally how value is created for each player. Too often, applications are missing this piece. They either have a solution that works well in a research setting, or a solution that has worked well only in a pilot setting, where the inputs and attention paid are not reflective of what would be possible in a real world setting. To be scalable, a solution needs to have a robust and tested operational strategy. I'll put up examples from Sabia Nueva and from SMART to give you a sense of the type of information we would expect to see and how they successfully conveyed it. I'm not gonna go through these step-by-step -step in depth right now, but I do encourage you to come back to the slides for inspiration on succinctly summarizing your own business model. And here is the example from SMART where they used a couple of slides to describe how products, services, and funding flows, who the key players are, and how they are creating value for each. Okay, now we understand the problem and the solution, and we wanna understand the evidence showing that it works. Now I want you to hang with me here for a few minutes because there's something that we commonly see missing from applications when we ask about evidence, and that's data to support the key assumptions in your model. When we read through the evidence that's presented and compare that to the model, we're often left with huge leaps of faith that one key step will lead to the next. Perhaps you've shown us evidence that consuming biofortified maize can decrease the nutrient deficiencies and improve health. That's great, that's important. But we're still left wondering, how do we know that the incentives you put in place have resulted in the seeds getting to the target farmers? And how do we know that the maize grown from these seeds retains its nutritional content regardless of the farming practices or environment? How do we know if people even consume enough of the maize in their regular diets to make a meaningful difference in nutrient deficiencies? What we and other funders of scale need to see to have confidence that you have something worth scaling is the evidence you have to support the most critical impact and implementation assumptions in your model. What have you learned through your monitoring and evaluation efforts to support these assumptions? To give you a really clear framework for identifying those critical assumptions in your model, I am going to use a dramatically oversimplified theory of change. We're not gonna go down an academic rabbit hole here, I promise. But if you aren't familiar with it, a theory of change is essentially your framework for impact, saying that if you do A, then you believe B will happen, and if B happens, then C will happen, all the way from your inputs and activities to your outcomes and impact. It's a chain of assumptions. Ideally, you're always working to understand 
and validate these assumptions and tweaking your model where assumptions approve false. What we're interested to see when we ask for evidence that your solution is working are the data, studies, and research supporting the most critical assumptions related to your target impact and your model's implementation for that impact. Let's look at the evidence that Samia Nueva presents in their slide deck, aligning to some of the most critical impact and implementation assumptions for their model. They provide data about the nutrition content and absorption potential for the seeds that they have bi biofortified, which gives us confidence in their R&D output. They cite a research study that found that consuming biofortified maize does lead to meaningful changes in health. And they provide data from a research study showing that families who plant biofortified maize do consume enough to close gaps in key nutrients. They continue by sharing additional monitoring data, which helps us see that the biofortified seeds are actually getting to farmers and being planted, and that there are increasing numbers of people consuming the biofortified maize. Of course, this is still a small snapshot of their evidence. And in later rounds, we had lots of additional questions for Semilla Nueva about these and other assumptions in their model. But the breadth of evidence across these assumptions that they shared with us in phase one gave us confidence that they closely assess and monitor the linkages across their model and have an evidence base of support. Okay, let's move on. Two more questions to cover. APIs. So while your key performance indicators are part of your base of evidence per the last question, we call them out specifically here because we want to be sure that you include three of your most important impact related KPIs along with the results for those KPIs for each of the past three years. As we look at your KPIs, we're trying to understand the impact metrics that you deem most meaningful to understand and drive your work. And through your results, the magnitude of your work and the traction you've gained over each of the past three years. We have a lot more that we could say about creating good KPIs, um, but if you're interested, we will just put a link in the chat and you can read more on your own. What we like about Simia Nueva's KPIs is that they go beyond just counting activities and they track things that are meaningful, not just to them as an organization, but to their target audience. They could have reported something like the number of seeds produced or the number of farmers educated, but those aren't meaningful to the farmers or to the consumers. And they also don't really help Simia Nueva manage their impact. What we wanna see is that your KPIs are action oriented and not just checking the box for activities delivered. We wanna see at least one that's related to outcomes experienced by your target beneficiary or one of your target beneficiaries. And importantly, we wanna see that you have three years of data to show for each of them. Again, having at least three years of data is part of our eligibility criteria because you cannot scale something that you haven't fully understood or started to understand. So if you don't yet have three years of data against your KPIs, we ask you to please sit this year out while you continue to test your solution. And we hope to see you back when you have at least three years under your belt. And last question, your scaling plan. There are two key ideas around scaling and scaling impact that I wanna highlight here. First is that this is a scaling prize, a prize that's intended to support an enterprise's acceleration versus contributing to more incremental growth based on routine operations and activities. 
not every organization is interested in or well positioned to scale. So if your organization is looking for funding to support business as usual with some incremental growth and incremental changes, we think that is very worthy of an ask, but it's just not a fit for the Kirby Impact Prize. Next, what do we mean by scaling impact more specifically? Scaling impact is when an enterprise is expanding their current impact or innovation to match the size of the problem they are trying to solve. The thing they are scaling is not profits or their footprint per se, but rather their impact. Sometimes this can mean growing an entire organization, but most often it also includes supporting others to implement your solution, partnering with governments, advocating for policy change, et cetera. We invite you to watch a short video further describing what we mean by scaling impact, which we'll put into the chat and is also on the prize webpage. CASE supports many different types of scaling strategies and there's no one right way to be successful in the application process. Here we have a glimpse of Simeon Nueva's scaling plan that they shared with us in phase one, where we can see that indeed they are on an acceleration uh, growth path. We can see that they're focused really on impact as their scaling goal. That's what's driving the scale. They've identified and planned around clear scaling strategies. They're working on geographic expansion. They're working to bring down the costs and time it takes to breed seeds. They're working to get the government uh, to cover subsidies to make it more sustainable and also to broaden their reach. And they share reasonable key milestones for this journey to give us confidence that they have a well thought through strategy. For SMART, they spoke to a moment in time, an explosion in rural technology adoption that they're leveraging to accelerate impact at scale. And we can see in what they provided to us, clear strategies they will deploy to build upon their assets and take advantage of this moment. They're going to increase the number of impactful products that are available to rural citizens, geographic expansion, and they're helping to increase the support that others provide to rural citizens for their livelihoods. So what happens if you are selected? We will have one prize winner in 2025, and we will announce that prize winner in May of 2025. The winning enterprise will receive a $150,000 unrestricted award, will be amplified through CASE's network, will be offered institutional support from CASE and Fuqua. And we also ask that uh, the winner provides a brief annual narrative um, or having a brief annual conversation with us talking about their progress so we can continue to learn from each other. We also think it's helpful for you to learn more about some of the organizations who have won the prize over the past four years, and also learn about the finalists from the past few years. On our website, we have profiles for each of them, including the reasons we are excited about the potential for their scale. I also wanna note that uh, our winners the last three years, Serve Minnesota's Math Corps, SMART, and Samia Nueva were repeat applicants. They had applied previously and didn't win, but came back and, and showed us how they had continued to, um, to be thoughtful in their strategy and can you continue to test and to learn. So if you have more questions, um, we probably have answers to many of them on our website and through the links on our website. Um, we have lots of resources up there. We also do have a place um, after or even after this info session for you to submit additional questions about the application. 
um, there is a there is a link here. You can see submit a question. There's a link on our website um, where you can submit questions, and we will update our frequently asked questions document as we receive those questions. Let's turn now to your questions in the chat. If there are any questions that have not yet been um, been adequately answered or new ones that you would want to um, put in. Aaron, David, are there any that, that we haven't been able to address? So far, I think you've addressed them all or we've been able to address them with some of the links. Nope. So oh. Oh. I can't hear you. So far, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Well, I was saying, Cam, that so far we're good on, okay. on the questions. Right. And uh, um, open call to everybody else to put some in the chat. Can you please share the link to submit additional questions? Yes. Great. So, um, so again, we will we will follow up and um, and share um, the links to all of these resources, these slides with the interactive links, um, the recording as well will be on our website. And on October 24th, when the um, application goes live, we will also share with you um, the link um, from, from that, uh, the link where you go to the platform to apply. Okay, I see, I see a few more in here. Um, the link to the questions. Can we use some slides used in previous applications? Absolutely, we want you to leverage what you have. Um, you can absolutely reuse slides submitted in previous applications. Um, okay, someone says, I saw in the FAQ that typically business support organizations are not a good fit for the prize. Could you provide some insight into why that is? Yes, um, previously we have, we have seen that, um, that many of the business support organizations um, aren't necessarily, don't necessarily employ a scalable model to continue providing that support and increase the support um, of many more um, organizations. The, the evidence base to collect for that is also really challenging to say, um, to, to demonstrate how your support has actually helped um, the, the organizations that you're supporting. Um, we did have, we did have one such organization though in the finalist round last year. Um, so, um, so again, you know, generally we've seen that those are not good fits, um, but we have seen strong ones that have, that have made it through. Um, another question, do you support organizations who directly provide impact or do you also consider ecosystem players um, such as tools that help social enterprises or nonprofits? Um, I'm not exactly sure if, if, if this is answering the question, um, but, um, but organizations don't need to be achieving and creating direct impact in order to apply. We very much um, are interested as well in organizations who are engaged in systems change um, and who might be um, creating impact through lots of different partners as well. Um, so, so, you can please add in add in below if uh, if that doesn't respond to your question. Um, Aaron, anything else you would want to say about that? No, I think that I think that you answered that well. And if if there's a further follow up, Elaine, happy to help answer that as if if you have it. Um, let's see. Is there parameters of scale? Any any amount of growth? Um, no, I mean some some organizations that have applied and have been successful are scaling really deeply um, across a smaller size population, and some are scaling much more broadly, but in a um, a less deep way. So we uh, do not have any parameters um, for scale for kind of magnitude and and depth. Um, just, just that there is some kind of um, beyond incremental growth, some kind of uh, trans transformation that you are undertaking to really scale your impact on, on a population, on a place. 
um, on scale evidence, must a solution be one that has been researched or studied? So there does not need to be a double blind, <laughs> um, R, there does not need to be an RCT that has already been done. Um, we, we do want to see that there is, um, that there are mechanisms and systems in place to continue learning and understanding, again, each of those linkages um, across your, your theory of change. Um, and we do want to see um, evidence of impact, you know, things that can be a combination of data that you're collecting, studies that you have done, but also external research that, um, that might have proven one or two of the linkages that, that you're relying upon um, in your theory of change. So you do not need to um, have a, um, a published study. Um, this seems a very economic impact model. How does it work for applicants seeking non-economic impact? I'm not sure that I totally understand that question. Aaron, do you? Um, I, th I think the answer is that we are happy with economic or um, non-economic impact models. So what we're looking for is what is the impact that you're seeking and how do you define that? How are you tracking towards that? And how are you showing us that you are, you know, creating a scaling strategy that's going to narrow that gap between the current efforts and the magnitude of need? So that might look like an organization like Samia Nueva that is talking about economic impacts on farmers and can quantify the you know, financial gains from the people that they're working with. But often it does not look like, you know, such a financial um, set of metrics. It might look like, you know, increases in, in literacy rates or um, changes in um, outcomes for marginalized populations in different communities. So I, I think that's what the question is getting at. And, and so if, if yeah. I have that right, then the answer is, is yes, we are you know happy to look at either economic or non-economic impacts uh, in your model and and uh, excited to read more about what you do. Yes, and 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 I also want to point out, thanks, Aaron. And I also want to point out that our first two years winners, um, their impact was not um, economic impact per se. Um, uh, Math core was focused on um, bringing students up to um, a you know, grade level in um, in math, a, a tutoring, scalable tutoring program, um, and healthy learners was focused on um, health of school aged children. Um, how many winners are considered? Um, we we will so again we will accept up to two hundred and fifty applications, one prize a year. David, I see you took care of that. Thank you. Um, award or page limit for the write ups. So um, so yes, we will. Um, we will provide a, a template um, for if you want to write up responses to the questions instead of submitting a slide deck, and we will um, put word limits on there. It's not a hard and fast limit, but to give you a sense of, um, of the amount of content that we're looking for. Um, can you submit an application with a partner organization? So it's supporting two organizations. Um, I, would, I would say to have one of the partners be the one to submit the, um, the application. Um, and, and you can certainly speak to, um, speak to the, the partnership. I mean, I think, you know, again, collaboration is great. None of us is going to solve any of these problems alone. Um, but I would say to have just one main organization um, applying. Let's see. Is the selection committee composed of faculty, external SMEs, students? Um, so the selection committee is, is composed of uh, case faculty and staff, um, and also um, a select group of our second year MBA students that we um, will be training and mentoring. Okay. That we have gotten to all of them. Um, um, and as as I said, there will be um, there will definitely be opportunities to um, to ask more questions. If you have them, we will be sharing um, the slide deck. And um, and we really we appreciate your time joining us today. And uh, and thank you all for the um, the incredible work that you 
are doing. Have a good day. Thank you very much for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks.